Resting at your table. Surrounded by your glow. Surrounded by your glow. I want to be where you are. Dwelling in your presence. Dwelling in your presence. Fishing at your table. Fishing at your table. Surrounded by your glow. Surrounded by your glory. I want to be where you are. I want to be where you are. Dwelling in your presence, Lord. Dwelling in your presence. Fishing at your table, Lord. Fishing at your table. Surrounded by your glory. Surrounded by your glory. I want to be where you are. your table, at your table. Surrounded, by your glow. surrounded by your glory, I want to be where you are, dwelling in your presence, fisting at your table, surrounded by your glow. your presence that's where I always want to be I just want to be I just want to be with you I just want to be I just want to be want to be with you I just want to be with you I just want to be gazing at your beauty Lord I just want to be I want to be where you are, dwelling in your presence, fisting at your table, surrounded by your glory. That's a hard desire. We want to be where you are. We never want to get tired. Dwelling in your presence, fisting at your table, surrounded by your glory. One more time. I want to be where you are. I want to be where you are. Dwelling in your presence, fisting at your table. Oh, wrap me in your arms. Wrap 
not come to seek the Lord in vain. Make me whatever 
see the break, see the break in our world, yes, in which the name, in which the name of the Lord alone is glorified. I see the break in our day. Out of the ashes of my night today, I see the break, breaking of a brand new day. In which name, in which the name of the Lord alone is. See the breaking of a new day. Breaking of a brand new. Lift your voice. See out of the ashes. Of my diet. I see the break. I see the breaking of a brand new day. In which day. Of the Lord alone is glory. See the breaking of a brand new day. Breaking of a brand new day. Out of the ashes, out of the ashes of my dying today. I see the break, I see the breaking of a brand new day. In which the name of the Lord alone is glorified. I see the breaking of a brand new. In which name, in which the name of the Lord alone is glorified. I see the breaking of a brand new day. In which the name, in which the name, in which the name of the Lord alone is glorified. I see the breaking of a Oh, in which the name.
is glorified. I see the breaking of a brand new day. In which the name, in which the name of the Lord alone is glorified. I see the breaking of a brand new day. The Lord alone is glorious. See the breaking of a brand new day. See the breaking of a brand new day. Allah name Zotheveke. Father, we ask that in the name of the Lord Jesus, you help us to make the necessary transition in the spirit. You help us, oh God to cross over father and make the necessary transition in the spirit the song says out of the ashes of my dying today i see the breaking of a brand new day the apostle began to say for i die daily i die daily there is a daily transition oh god that you call us to make father help us to appropriate rightly Help us to appropriate rightly the dying that we experience on a daily basis. May we not call it the dying of our spirits, but may we understand, oh God, it is the dying of the weightiness of the flesh out of us and away from us that we may enter into the abundance of your spirit. Kalanes over here. Father, fix our perspective. Fix our perspective. Give us the imagination of you. Give us the understanding of you. Father, correct our lenses. Do not give us just only human 2020 vision, but give us the God-like 2020 vision. The God-like 2020 vision. Accuracy in the spirit to be able to interpret things as you, O oh God, will interpret them. Out of the dying of my eyes today I see the breaking of a brand new day yes Lord in which the name of the Lord alone is glorified see the breaking of a brand for the promise of God unto us is beauty for ashes. This is the spiritual transaction that we make. That we take the ashes and we exchange it for the beauty that is available to us. So Lord Jesus, I pray for everyone that is going through a seemingly dying season. I pray for everyone that is going through a situation that is so overwhelming it feels like they're dying it feels like a part of them is being lost it feels like a huge chunk of them is being yanked out a chunk of their pride a chunk of their glory a chunk of their name a chunk of their finances a chunk of their peace a chunk of their joy anyone that is going through such a situation a chunk of their self-esteem a chunk of their understanding oh god father i pray that in the name of the lord jesus that if there be any such person under the sound of my voice oh god that there be a release a release a release of the transaction of the spirit over them that lord god you will put inside of such people the necessary faith to be able to convert their, their ashes for beauty in the name of the Lord Jesus let their testimony be the testimony of this song that out of the ashes of their dying is the breaking of a brand new day out of the ashes of their dying let it be the breaking of a brand new day over the ashes of their dying let a new gate in time be opened unto them. Over the ashes of their dying, let a new gate in the realm of the spirit be opened unto them. Let a new season of opportunity be opened unto them. Let a new season of grace be opened unto them. Let a new season of revelation be opened unto them. Let a new day of understanding break over them. In the name of the Lord Jesus.
Karamunde Suda Bahai, Lende Beke Setala, in which the name of the Lord alone is glorified. A seed of breaking of a brand new day. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. In the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is so good to see everyone. Um, it is good to see you, Omoye. <laughs> Praise God. Pastor Busola, how are you? When is your next sermon? Is that next week? Two weeks' time. Two weeks' time. Fantastic. All right. So, Pastor Linda says that I'm teaching about prayer today. So, we shall teach about prayer. Amen. And it says that's what we are doing in the month of May. Yeah. And I have to respect authority. Abby. Yeah. So, we'll teach about prayer. Um... I like to bring context to every message. Because many times, I mean, in the way the world has schooled the average believer. And I say the world has schooled the average believer because many times we forget that we are constantly being educated. And because we are unaware of the educational method of the spirit realm, we do not realize that um, it is either the kingdom of darkness, the mentality of the kingdom of darkness, or the mentality of the kingdom of light that is driving our daily decisions. So many times you realize that you arrive at a point of destiny and you arrive at a point where you are meant to make a critical decision that would determine your future and the future of generations to come. And then you make a decision and you realize that there is a war within you. And the decision of the spirit of God that should come naturally to you is no longer your natural response. And so even though you sit in church and even though you were raised in a Christian family, you then realize that when it comes to the point of decision making, which is really the determination of how well you have been schooled. Because any child that goes to school cannot cannot boldly say that they have come out with a degree until they have passed the necessary examination. So it does not matter how long you have been in university. It does not matter how long you have been in school. Until you can pass the necessary test, you cannot boldly say that you, can, you have come out with a degree. And so the necessary tests are the things that qualify you to be able to boldly say that you have entered into a level. Now what do the tests look like? The tests are practical Practical. The test want to they want to try and see if you have a firm understanding of the theories and the principles that have been taught to you in the classroom. They want to see how you would decide concerning the things and how you would apply the methodologies that you have been thought, taught theoretically. It is at the point of examination that the teacher and the examiners and the institution is able to determine whether a student has been rightly prepared and a student student has the authorization to go out and operate in what he has been taught in the past one, two, three years. In the same way, in the realm of the spirit, you are constantly being schooled by the Spirit of God. You are constantly being schooled by the host of heaven. You are constantly being schooled by the ecclesia of God. You are constantly being schooled by tutors and mentors because as long as a hair remains a child, he remains under the authority of tutors and mentors. And as you grow, the degree and the level of your tutors and your mentors, it begins to change and it begins to evolve to accommodate the weightiness of your destiny and to accommodate the level of your understanding and so because we are constantly being schooled we are constantly going through seasons of examination we are constantly going through times when we are being examined by God to see if we have arrived in the fullness of knowledge concerning the past experiences of our lives Adam and Eve they went through a season of tutelage where the Lord created them and in from Genesis chapter 2 the Lord blessed them and the Lord gave them inheritance of the 
of the garden and said to them, you will fill the whole earth. But according to the story we see in Genesis, they were meant to begin from the garden. So the garden became their place of primary schooling. The garden became their place of primary education. The garden became the place where the foundational knowledge of what it means to have dominion and power was going to be imparted to them. And the garden became the place of pre-qualification to be able to enter into the dominion of all the earth. And so Adam and Eve did not understand that they were going through a theoretical teaching training program of Eden. And so when the time came for examination, which was the presence of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam and Eve did not realize they were going through an examination that will lead to promotion or demotion. And so, but the thing about the realm of the spirit, that demotion is not necessarily that you will repeat the same class. Demotion sometimes will mean you will fall into a broken realm and you will fall into a realm of darkness that has the potential to steal from you all the inheritance and all the resources that you had during the time of schooling. So in the realm of the spirit, we don't joke with the education of the spirit. We don't joke with the educational system because we don't pass and fail the way the world passes and fails. It is not a repetition of class. It is you now struggling to come out of a realm of darkness and brokenness and out of a place where your inheritance is now stolen from you because it is kill or be killed. So if you don't pass and if you don't overcome the devil, he will take from you the authority authority you had in that realm of being educated and so what you will now find out is that if you do not pass the education you do not pass the examination of that level you don't remain on that level you actually fall back to a lower level and you now have to begin to hustle back to arrive and to gain the resources that you had because what the devil comes to steal is to steal your authority is to steal your power is to steal your dominion this is why you cannot joke with the examination of the spirit. This is why you cannot joke with the seasons of testing. This is why you cannot joke with the times of evaluation. It is not enough to say the Lord is testing me. You must pass the test. Because if you don't pass the test, you will realize that your, your situation becomes worse off than you were before you enter the season of testing. I say this to you because I began by saying, it is expedient that we understand the educational system of the spirit. And it is expedient that you understand that you are constantly being educated. So what Eve did not realize was that at the point of her conversation with the serpent, an re-education was going on. And the re-education was trying to counter the knowledge of God. Was trying to cast down the image that the Lord had planted in her mind was trying to overturn and to change the position that the Lord had instituted in her spirit. So that as he began to have conversation with her, he began to limit and began to break and began to paralyze her position in God. That is why this generation is so dangerous. Because it is a generation of everybody has an opinion. You must listen to everybody. I don't have to listen to everybody. I don't have to entertain everybody's position. Because you see, the fall of Adam and Eve did not begin at the time they made the choice. It began at the moment they chose to entertain the conversations of Satan. So you must understand that the re-educational process of hell began, begins the day you open the door to a little thought from Satan. And you give him a little ground and he expands that ground. He multiplies himself in the midst of what you permit. This is why a true believer must be somebody who stands guard at all times. Your eyes and your ears are constantly open, constantly fine-tuned to hear the posture and position of God. So if you listen to the last statement I just said, your eyes and your ears are constantly opened, constantly listening so that you may be able to discern the posture and position of God in every matter. Then you begin to understand what prayer is. Because if I ask you now, what did it mean for Adam and Eve to pray? Adam and Eve did not do what we are doing today. They didn't have to sit in one place and say, Malaba, shakalaba, shakalaba, Lord Jesus, we worship you. There was no Jesus. There was no church. The things that we currently have today as a structure that has been set up by God to make amends for the brokenness that we have experienced did not exist. So it now the question now begs, what does it mean to pray? What 
doesn't mean to pray. So at some point, Jesus began to say, man ought always to pray and not to faint. That means the opposite of prayer is fainting. That means the opposite of prayer is fainting. If you see a man that is fainting, you have seen a man that is not praying. That means if you are truly praying, you don't faint. What does it mean to faint? To faint is not that you die. To faint is not that you cease to exi exist anymore in this realm. To faint means you are still here. Your body is still here. You are still on the record of the living, but you are no longer conscious and are no longer able to change your present realities. That is what it means to faint. So man ought always to pray and not to faint. If fainting is the opposite of prayer, that means it is possible that prayer means a man that is not fainting. A man that is present. A man that is able. A man that is mobile in the spirit. A man that has the capacity to engage life. That's a man of prayer. So that means if you are truly praying, you are able to walk in the authority and dominion that God originally allocated to Adam. Because in the original allocation of God, Adam was able to walk. Adam was able to engage. Adam was able to rule. Adam was able to dominate. Adam was not fainting. Because the original word for walk, if you've ever heard me preach, you know it. What else is the word for walk? Walk, serve, say. What is the word? Eved is the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word for work is called Eved. And Eved means to walk, to worship, to serve, slave, and servant. It means five things in one. Please write it down. I am not a minister that is in quest of big, big sermons. So when I say the Hebrew word for, the purpose of it is not so that I will sound like one intelligent. The purpose of it is so that you will come into understanding. Because a message is useless if the minds of the people are not converted. So the preaching of the gospel is for the conversion of men. That you will change your position and you will move into a higher level of engagement in the spirit. That is the purpose of this gospel. So the word evade is work, worship, serve, slave, servant. So a man that is in worship is a man that is working. A man that is in worship is a man that is serving. A man that is in worship is a man that is a slave to God. And when I say slave, you see chains and shackles and bruises all over you. That's not what it means to be a slave of God. It means that your heart, your spirit, your soul has been completely captivated. That he becomes the reason why you live and your soul purpose. And in him you live, you move, you have your being. And no part of you is in rebellion to his government and his lordship. That is what it means to be a slave of God. So, prayer for Adam and Eve looked like what? Submission to God. Walking and serving according to the ordinances of God. Fulfilling the mandate that the Lord gave to them. Communing one to one with another on the level of truth. Communing with God on the level of godliness. I said to some people this morning, I said godliness has different forms. There is the nature of godliness. There is the action of godliness. And there is the posture slash position of godliness. Many times when we talk about godliness, we are only talking, I repeat it, there is the nature of godliness. There is the action of godliness. And there is the posture slash position of godliness. Many times when we hear godliness, what we are talking about, we are thinking about is the nature of godliness. So we are thinking about that meek, kind, humble, true, pure nature. 
I was saying, wow, such a godly man. Oh, God, if you, when you will see him, if you will just hear the way, ah, very godly person. But you see, godly has its root in the word God. It is saying you have the nature or likeness of God. That's when you put Lee behind something like this thing. So godliness means a nature that is like God. Is God only kind? Is God only loving? Is God only pure? As a matter of fact, the nature of God is not just a state of being. The nature of God is, is out of what the actions of God proceed from. So that when God begins to act, his actions have a foundation. The foundation of the acts of God is the nature of God. So that when God begins to attack your enemy and he begins to kill people, somebody may look at it and say, this is violent. This doesn't sound like a God of heaven. No, his nature is where that action is coming from. And his action, even though it may appear violent, is actually proceeding from a place of love. If you understand these things, you will understand the law. And then you will begin to understand that the law is not given to enslave you. But the law is given to empower you. So that by reason of the law, which requires action, you may be able to enter into the nature of the lawgiver. So the law is not for enslavement. The law is for empowerment. Now, we are coming back to godliness. So there is that nature. Then there is the action of godliness. Which are the things you do? What are the actions of God? God is a ruler. God is a king that has dominion. God is a creator. The actions of godliness are as critical as the nature of godliness. The nature is but one level of qualification. You need to rise from just nature into action. Because faith without works is dead. Nature without action is useless. What use is the nature of an apple tree if it does not give me apple? The nature must produce an action that is beneficial and profitable unto men. Now there is the posture and position of godliness. The position of God is that he's the master of the universe. And he maintains that position. And that position is constantly being tried. And that is what the enemy is always doing. Trying to checkmate God. And to find him in an action that is not righteous or just. So that he, the enemy may say you are no longer qualified to sit upon the throne as the ruler of all the earth. So his position is also as important. His nature is what undergirds his throne. But his position is his throne as Lord. So if you will be a godly man, you must be able to arrive at all the levels. Why am I saying this? You need to unbox God. Because if you cannot understand God, who God is, then you cannot understand the concept of prayer. Because the concept of prayer is communion with God. And communication is not No. So when I see people say things like, um, is God deaf? Why do you have to shout? He's not deaf. But our shouting is not him we are shouting on. It's actually ourselves. It is you that is trying to be converted. So the burden is a burden to arrive at the mind of God. The burden is a burden to thrust yourself past the limitation of the flesh and to break the veil of darkness that you may arrive at a point where you are able to embrace the fullness of his light and his perspective. So the shouting is a burden. It's not God we are shouting on. It's a thrust we are thrusting ourselves. So when you then understand this God, and you then understand that he's Posture, positioning, and nature is for a purpose. A king that does not act is a useless king. A king without a vision is no king. That's why when you look at some nations, you say, ah, do we have a president? Because there is no action to prove the posture 
or the position that he has. Am I communicating? So when you begin to understand that God is about certain actions, he's not just waiting for men to say, we worship you, we bow before you, great and mighty, king and glory. All of those things, the action of bowing, what does it mean? How does it translate into nature, action, and position? He's not a, an egotistical being that is just waking up and saying, who is going to worship me today? Who is going to bow before me? I just need men to be singing my name up and down the universe. He doesn't need it. Whether or not we do it, it doesn't change his position as God. But we do it to confirm that we are yet in alignment with him and the transaction of our faith remains intact. It's the same way that men go and they bow before kings and from season to season they must pay homage to the king declaring that we are still part of your kingdom and our rulership is not in our name it is yet in your name. The progress we make is your progress and so we receive your backing and your security over us. I'm saying this to you so that you may understand what worship looks like. And so that you may understand what service to God truly looks like. Because we're talking about prayer. Because we're talking about prayer. So what did it look like for Adam and Eve to pray? What did it look like? Does it look like what we do today? Does it look like what we say today? So I say to people, every time of true prayer must bet a new perspective in you. Every time of true prayer must cause a transformation of thought and position in you. Every time of true prayer must cause a revolution against your flesh. If you truly pray, it is about arriving at a point of communion with the Lord. And communion is not, oh, Rababe, Yalasanga. Communion is on the level of thought and communication. He says, come, let us reason together. But how can you reason with somebody that you are not on the same educational level with? The reason why some of us struggle with people we work with is because the people don't have the same intelligence level that we have. How can you say, come, let us reason together with a man that has a different background, a different culture, a different interpretation of the items around you? For somebody who has never seen a keyboard before, if he walked into this room and he saw this keyboard, he may call it a cooking instrument. For somebody who has never seen a chair before, if he walks into this room and he sees a chair, he may call it an instrument of war. And then add on top of it that he does not speak English. And then I say to him, come let us reason together. How can we reason together? How can we build together? How can we create together? How can we dominate together? It is impossible because we are not communicating on the same level. When you understand this, then you begin to understand the barrier to the prayers of men. You begin to understand why many people never arrive at the intentions of God for their lives. Why many people never arrive at the blessedness that the Lord has secured for them from the beginning of the earth. Because they are not able to communicate with God on his level. When you understand what I'm talking to you to, about today, you begin to now understand the power and the purpose of the word. You begin to see that the Bible is not an instrument for money devotion. You begin to understand that the Bible, it becomes the machinery that enables the conversion of the minds of men. So that men mortals and broken vessels of clay may be able to arise to the level where they can communicate with an eternal God. The word of God is your transformation capsule. You cannot joke with the Bible. The word of God is the vehicle that enables a human man to journey into eternal truths. So when you understand these things that I'm communicating to you, because I am creating compartments in your mind and compartments in your spirit, so that the next time you fall down to pray, you have an expectation of transformation and an expectation of communication on the level of godliness. Are we still together? Expectation. Because you see, enough is enough. Enough of a church that never arrives at the execution of the purposes of God. Enough of a church that never arrives at the point of doing the things that Jesus died for. Jesus did not die for you to cast out devils. 
Yes, P.I. said it. Jesus did not die for you to heal the sick. Hear me clearly. Healing the sick and casting out devils are signs of who you are. They are not who you are because of the death of Christ. They are signs. A sign that have entered this room for somebody that knows me is that you may smell my perfume. And you say, Pia is here. A sign may be that for someone that knows me, you will hear my tongues. And you say, Pia is in this room. Those are signs. If you know me, if I enter the room and certain things are out of order, the moment you see people begin to shuffle in a certain manner to arrive at a level of administration, you will say perhaps PI is somewhere in the room. Why? Because it's a sign that follows my office and my nature. That there are certain expectations that I have of rooms where the Lord is. It is a sign. It is not who I am. Do you hear me? It says the sign does what? Follows them. It follows. So what is ahead is what determines the sign. So what is ahead of the church today? We are still on prayer. What is ahead determines what follows. What is ahead? You are not led by the things that follow you. You are led by by what is ahead of you. You cannot make your prayer. Lord, let your church amen. That the dead may be healed. That the blind eyes may open. How can you be praying to be led. By what should follow you. That means if you follow who you should be following. What should follow you will then follow you. But the question is where are you going? The question is, who are you at every moment in time? That is the most critical question. Not what follows you. Jesus died for something else. In the book of Mark, I believe, Mark 11. Moye was that scripture this morning. The disciples came to Jesus. The Bible says, and Jesus gave them power. You cannot miss prayer in this month month of May. It is the month of transition. It is the month of transformation. It is the month of determination and examination. After May, a new breed is rising up. After May, a new set of people will be formated out of the belly of the earth. It is expedient because it is ordained. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. So in the month of May, I will teach you about power. And we will look through all the power that exists in scripture. If it takes us seven days, we will obey it. If it takes us 21 days, we will obey it. I don't lack administration. I follow the spirit. That's my problem. It's not that I don't like structure. I am looking at another structure. Not the one that you write on by one paper. So if it's 16 days, we do it. But you see power, we must finish it. Because that is what we need. That's not who we are following. No. Remember, I taught you people those three positions of godliness. So there is the nature. There is the action. There is the posture slash position. So who we are following. This thing I'm talking about power. is only about position. The things that come with the position. Some actions that we will do but we are chasing after the nature the nature is our drive the nature is the foundation why did I enter power as we are talking about this topic of prayer because the disciples Jesus the Bible declares that Jesus called them and he gave them power over demons sicknesses snakes scorpions and the Bible says that they went. And I said to some people this morning, we have to question those disciples. Because think of my sister. It's just as if I just come to Linda now. Linda, I give you power to go and collect all Dangote's money. While you are at contact Bill Gates, tell him to send you $2 billion. Go! <laughs> Linda love me. Linda trust me. Boy. Do you understand what I'm talking about? 
So the question is, what did they worry the disciples? Hear me on the topic of prayer. Communicating with a God on the level of godliness. Conversation and communication and understanding is the key and the purpose of prayer. That he can look at you and say to you, go and do it in my name and you understand what he's saying. To the point where you understand and beyond the shadow of doubt, you know it's possible. There's no use praying if you cannot arrive at the point of promptly and effectively executing the things that God tells you while you pray. He said to them, go. They went. They too went to a demon-possessed man. Uzola. He's my handkerchief. Tissue. They went to demon possessed people, sick people. We that have seen and heard of the resurrection of Christ, we still don't have that chest. He had not died. They had not seen that he was the everlasting, eternal God. An earthquake had not happened, the whole earth had not become dark. They had not seen him in a transfigured body, yet eating fish with them. So they did not have the testimony of his eternal glory that we have. Yet he said to them as a main man like them, go and they went. Somebody say prayer. So when Jesus was with them, who were they praying to? When Jesus was with them, who were they praying to? What did prayer look like for them? Because where we are going to today in this prayer topic is the fig tree. So what did prayer look like? Thank you. They said, Jesus, give us this day. Shake us up. Jesus, let's hold powerful prayer meeting. Anoint us, ordain us. Put your, your spirit inside of us. Give us your mantle. Jesus said, calm down. Calm down. People have been following those Pharisees and Sadducees too long. You just see somebody finish preaching. You come and need that. Mama, I want what you have. That's why I tell people, stand up. Stand up. Pierre, just lay, just lay hands on me. Hola. Think is by that. The laying of hands is a confirmation of something. I don't know you. You can ask me to pray for you if you are sick. You can do that and say to me, P.I., my XYZ, my container is stuck. Pray with me. We can do that. But don't come and tell me, give me what you have. It is not giving like that. Jesus healed the sick, raised the dead. But the secret, he called his disciples inside. Because there are some things that are not given like that. Some things are given because you have passed the confirmation test. So it can be released unto you. Because the process of the confirmation is in the communication, heart to heart, mind to mind. When you arrive at the level of same thought, same decisions, same posture, then you can have what he has. That is the level of prayer where whatsoever you ask, you shall be given. It's not because you knelt down. It's not because you cried. The people who received things because they knelt down and cried, that got it from nowhere publicly, it was miracles and solutions for their situations, not the impartation of the office. Are we clear? Aha. Uh -huh. So they went out and they were healing sick, raising dead. And they came back to Jesus, shouting, Hey, Jesus, the demons obeyed us when we spoke to them in your name. I will not touch in your name. Here, I'll touch it in prayer. Right? And Jesus said to them, very good. Please, water. 
very good. Let me open it. He said, but he said, I beheld Satan falling like lead me from heaven. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. He said, this thing that you are doing, that you are shouting about, I already saw it thousands of years ago. Satan is falling. Do not let your rejoicing be in the fact that you overcame somebody that has already fallen. Do not let your rejoicing be in the fact that you won the boxing match over a man that was down before you even gave him the first blow. How can you be shouting for that? When the time you entered the ring, he was already bleeding on the floor. And then you are shouting up and down. Jesus basically was saying, don't be a spiritual buyer. Calm down. He said, rather, let your rejoicing be in the fact that your names are now written in heaven. So Jesus was basically trying to tell the disciples that there is a higher glory that you have been called to. Which is not the glory of casting out demons, but the glory of operating from heaven. But the glory of not having a new residential address. The glory of not having a new place of communication. The glory of not having a new level of evaluation. The glory of not having a new power that you operate by. It is not this one that is the proof of what you have entered into. The Satan is falling. So a falling creature cannot be the determination of who you are. Are we understanding what I'm trying to say? Satan is one of the things that Jesus had to deal with. But he's not the reason why Jesus died. Hear me. He is one of the things that Jesus had to deal with. But he's not the reason why Jesus died. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Jesus gave his life for a higher cause and for a higher purpose which is for the restoration of man to the level of godliness. Satan took position, posture, and nature. Guys, stop moving around unnecessarily. Christian busybody is no good. That's how matter could have lost it. Sit down when movement is not necessary. So, the things that they did, they did because they had a relationship with Jesus. And the relationship with Jesus was what determined what Jesus gave to them. And what Jesus gave to them was what determined what they were able to do, what they were able to perform. That means prayer is about a relationship. Prayer is about the building of a relationship to the level of trust and commitment. If that is what prayer is, then that means every time you lift your head and you lift your hand, what you are doing must be able to transcend beyond the tangible explanation of words and music and melody. These things are but physical, tangible expressions of a deeper interaction that is happening. They are tangible expressions of an intangible interaction that is happening on the level of godliness. When you pray, it is not about the pitch of your voice. It is not about the next song you raise. That's why I'm always hounding your worship ministers. I say it is not about singing forever, oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven, it is settled. Take glory, Father, take glory, Son. How I finish that one? New day, today, not tomorrow. And then the church too. My, eh, eh, we answer me today. You know the dance step to every song. Do, 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 do. Ah, wait, come, come. Because if it is truly worship, it's not the keyboard you are following. It's not actually even the people's response you are following. 
It is not about the next song that we bring the next high. Or that we take you to the next temple. The temple is something, the temple is something else in the spirit. David said, place you are following. It is the dancing of the king that determines your song. It is not the dancing of the people. It is the response of the spirit to the melody that determines whether you change, you stop, or you sing nothing. It is the spirit that is the choir master, not the people, not the musician that went to music school. So, these things are physical expressions of a more powerful, intangible communication that is going on in the spirit realm that can only be interpreted by men of the spirit. Because you cannot talk about prayer without talking about what it truly means to be a spiritual man. You cannot talk about prayer without talking about what it truly means to engage on the level of godliness. This is why we do seven days fasting and talking. Seven days diet, as far as I'm concerned, and talking and nothing changes. Because seven days of prayer and fasting changes things. But perhaps our definition of fasting and prayer is different. That's why God went to meet them in Isaiah 58 and says, you have no eating food. Your bone is dry. You are shouting up and down. But yet these things mean nothing to me. Is this not the fast that is accepted? It is not that you inflict your soul. But that you bring righteousness to people. You transform your society. You change the nation that you are in. You pay attention to your family and you bring conversion to the lives of men. What was God saying? Listen, this is where today's church has missed it. Because you read Isaiah 58 and we write it powerfully in a book. And there's somebody, they go and they take the expressions of a fast and they want to perform the expressions in the physical while they have not attended to the process that should bet the expressions by grace. So you try to attend to the expressions of it. You now say, now, that means according to Isaiah 58, that means I should change society. I'm going to run for a governmental position. That means, oh, I should feed the poor. I'm going to go and buy food and feed the poor. Without attending to the process that should bet that nature in you by grace. And because you did not bet it by grace, what then happens is that five years later, we come back and we look for you. You have now become like the very system you claim to go into to change. Why? Because you did not go there in the exousia and the dynam the dynamics of God had not been formed in you. So you did not have the ability to overtake the system. So God was not saying that they should not fast and pray. God was saying that they were not truly fasting and praying. Because if they were truly fasting and praying, it should have confirmed, it should have transformed their souls and transformed their level of thinking from fasting and praying for personal provision into the transformation that enables them to change their nation, their families, and the systems of the world. That means true prayer and fasting changes the way you think. True prayer and fasting releases the spirit of Adonai over you which is one of the seven spirits of God, which is the first and foremost spirit that feeds oil to the other six spirit. And Adonai is the owner, the spirit of ownership. It comes over you. Something happens to the way you begin to look at Mafoluku. You no longer see it as a region or as an opportunity for government contract. You see it as a region of darkness over which light shall arise. And you then begin to have the ability to interpret what light means correctly. That light is not a loud sermon and a crusade. But light is that to every instrument of darkness and every manifestation of darkness in poverty, sin, shame, pain, rape is challenged by a new system and protocol by which men are rescued from the captivity of a broken earth. True fasting and praying can make a man become a king. Can make a man become a president. 
Not because he sought to be a president, but because by reason of the outworking of godliness and in the spirit of Adonai, you begin to take charge of things around you and the resources of heaven are directed towards you because you have arrived at trust and commitment. Prayer is not a religious instrument. It is a tool for sons. For deep calls unto deep. Shallow calls unto shallow. Darkness beckons unto darkness. Just because you are kneeling down and singing a song doesn't mean you are provoking the depth of God. I never pray a prayer point that I have never prayed before. Let me explain what I mean. I pray to pray. I pray so that I can pray right. Are you understanding, Busola? My first prayer is towards my transformation. Then my transformation is what bets the perspective that releases the true God-like prayer. Because if I see you today and I see you don't have money, in my normal nature or in my limited expression and interaction with holiness, the first fruit I might have arrived at is kindness. So I think to be kind is what it means to be godlike. So the first thing I want to do is say, ah, my brother, take 20 naira. That's why many people are poor. Because they have equated godliness to kindness. But it's bigger than that. To be like God is not just to be compassionate, but you must have power to not only solve their immediate problem, but to transform their lives completely. So you give everything you have to a person and to a system till you became poor and broke like the same person and system. And yet none of you changed. Why? Because you did not understand that if you prayed a little bit further, you would have arrived at another perspective of the matter. And perhaps God would have shown you, first of all, the foundational generational curse in his father's house. And then you cannot begin to release a level one deliverance on the person. And then after that, you raise up in another perspective and you begin to see that the person has an educational problem. He has not been educated in the way of the spirit. He has never attended a school of the spirit where the mind of a man is taught to no longer think on the low level of flesh and carnality, but to arrive to the level of the mind of God. He has not been educated on the speech of a God. He has not been educated on the thinking pattern of a God. He has not been educated on the spending nature of a God. You pray so that you can pray right. Your first prayer is for you to be converted into the mind and the thinking culture of heaven. Before you begin to bind and cast principalities, secure yourself above them. This is why many people are taking several sons of Skiva. They had a history of a family of priests. They had all the Razzmatazz of religion, but they lack the capacity to change. Having a nature of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Prayer. Prayer. Have I laid a foundation? Because we have not started the sermon. Tonight, come to the school of the Spirit. For don't you know that in His hands are the keys to eternal life? It's a little day and a little day until the day will dawn. He's at work in you, working everything in obedience to Christ. 
Swallow your pride Tonight Come us to the school of the spirit Swallow your pride For don't you know That in his hands Is the key to eternal life Ah, month of May A little here A little there Until the day will dawn He is at work in you Bringing everything In obedience to Christ Realigning Everything In obedience to Christ Restoring Restoring everything In obedience to Christ that is the purpose of the teaching. That there will be restoration, realignment. Tenny, you are looking at me. Enjoying the sermon. Don't I have another preaching engagement? Hey, hey you've been telling me. <laughs> Did they agree to 8 or my still 8.20? 8.20, good. So that means I have to leave here. 8.15, latest. Fantastic, all right. Mark 11, go there quickly. Come to the school of the Spirit. For don't you know in his hands is the key to eternal life. A little here, a little there until the day will dawn. He said, walk in me, walk in everything, in obedience to Christ. Out of the ashes, out of the ashes of my dying today, I see the breaking of a brand new day. The name of the Lord alone is glorified. I see the breaking of a brand new day. Are you now understanding why we sang that song in the beginning? Out of the ashes of my dying. I see the breaking of a brand new day. A believer that is not comfortable with death can never be a spiritual believer. At best, at best you will be a carnal believer. Because there is a natural man, a carnal man, and a spiritual man. Three categories of men. The natural man is the one that has not been rejuvenated by the spirit of God. So he does not even understand. He has not seen the Lord. Neither has he entered into the kingdom. So he does not have any of the conversions that happen by reason of a first-hand engagement with truth. Natural man. Everything is interpreted from what he's seeing. What is observable. That is how he makes his decisions. A carnal man has given his life to Christ. He knows that Jesus is Lord, but he has not allowed the conversion that breaks the cocoon of flesh so that the spirit may arise. So in decision making, there is often a mixture and there is a consistent war for the position of God. But the spiritual man is the man that has put the cloak and the coat of carnality and he has said, let it all be damned. I count it as dung that I may arrive at the nature and the thinking of Christ. A believer that is not comfortable with death cannot arrive at being a spiritual man. Because the perfect process of death on any level in any language is never fun. Whether you say death in Chinese or you say death in English, or you say death in tongues, death is death. Never fun. One of the first things you experience in death is vulnerability. 
You feel vulnerable. You feel exposed. You feel weak. Because your strength leaves you. And it is only by faith that you have strength. But out of the ashes of your dying is the signaling of a new day. Because the only way a dead man can survive this world is by now taking on the life of Christ. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and he gave his life for me. It is no longer I that lives. So that means it's possible for you to meet someone you went to primary school with and it is not the person you went to primary school with that is still there. His face, same looks, same hairstyle, but a completely different human being. Why? No longer you that lives, but Christ that now lives in you. So that, that means for a person to now have the nature and the mind of Christ, that means he must die first. But the question is, how does death happen? It must be something that challenges your system to the point of shutdown. Are you hearing me? It challenges your system to the point of shutting down. What does that look like? Challenges the principles you lived by. The things your mother and your father taught you that worked for them. There's something comes that challenges them to the point where they shut down. You are left wondering, how do I survive? How do I move on? There are some deaths that happen to you naturally. There are some deaths that happen to you supernaturally out of the love of God for you. And there are some deaths that you provoke in prayer. You provoke it in prayer in covenant with the Lord. Those are the best deaths. Because it's death of honor. Do you know the image that comes to my mind? When kings are dying at war. They will rather they tell their superintendent, choke me with the sword, put it, let me fall upon it and die. Than for the Philistine to kill them. Honorable death. The one that in prayer, like Jesus, in Gethsemane. Not my will, but yours be done. Take away from me any carefulness that makes me want to preserve my life. Give me the recklessness of the spirit. Even though it appears reckless to the physical man, let me be in alignment with your will. That's honorable death. You take the sword and you point it to your own self and you tell yourself, die. That Christ may live. I've seen this thing, it's sounding like action film but are the things of the physical not expressions of the things in the spirit many believers have been schooled wrongly remember I started with education have been educated wrongly and poorly educated by carnal systems but the Lord is calling you to a spiritual order Mark 11 And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. And when he had looked around about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry and seeing the fig tree afar off. Having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and would not suffer that any man 
man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he thought, saying unto them, it is it not written, my house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the scribes and chief priests had it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. And when even was come, he went out of the city. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, said unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. He called to Jesus' remembrance because Jesus was just walking past it as though he did not talk to the tree yesterday. It was Peter that had to say, bro, stop. Look at the tree again. It is dead. Because Jesus did not bother to check it out because he knew it would die. He did not need to check whether there's proof of his death. So he says, master, he called to his remembrance saying unto him, master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. And Jesus answering said unto them, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he said. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Yakata. <laughs> But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. And they come again to Jerusalem and he was walking in the temple. There came to him the chief priests and the scribes and the elders and said unto him, What authority dost thou do these things? And who gave thee the authority to do these things? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I will also ask of you one question and answer me. And I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven? Answer me. And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But if we shall say of men, they feared the people. For all men counted John that he was a prophet indeed. And they answered and said unto Jesus, We cannot tell. And Jesus answering said unto them, Neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. God bless you. I will see you next week Thursday. And I will teach you all the elements of prayer within the verses I just read. Every single verse I read was talking about prayer. Every one of them. From scattering the temple. When you stand to pray. <laughs> that means prayer is a stance. Prayer is a posture of stability. Prayer is not damsel in distress. We look at everything. Eh? We look at why the fig tree and why does it intertwine with the scattering of the temple. Every scripture it's an encoded message from an eternal God. It is a clever and intelligently woven set of codes that unlocks men into the power of eternity. Every scripture. I tell people, if you'll be powerful, honor the text. Let me closely, you will understand that my greatest prayer is to enter into the level of reasoning as God. Not the outlook of what religious people call prayer.
But my greatest prayer is conversion. That's how I'm able to arrive at the level of articulation. Many people pray for hours and never desire conversion. That's why they 